Why don't we pray? Father, we thank you. Thank you that we can gather today. Thank you that we can come together to look in your word. And we pray that your spirit would teach us, that you would give us understanding, that you would even make application of your word into our lives, into our heart. And that it would pierce deeply as you would speak to us and that we would know you and that we would be prepared and, and sanctified and transformed by you, Lord. May we surrender to your will. May we surrender to the working of your hand in and through our lives. And we ask that your hand would be upon this time in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to talk today about abiding in Jesus. And as I was stating through the announcements, as the times unfold, we'll respond to current events and situations that are happening before our eyes. Right now, it's time to continue to pray, to seek the Lord, and see what he's going to do. But we definitely will keep current on on the days we're living in. And I think this message really is a part of that, to keep us current in our position with the Lord, our place with Christ. Now more than ever, we have to abide in Christ, stay close to Jesus Christ. We need to allow the Lord to abide in us, to to live out his life in us and through us. We need to take inventory of our own life like David said, search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Very important that we stand as a holy people, a holy church. A church that is surrendered to God's will, not my own. A church that is allowing the Lord to live my life, or live out my life. To be a people that, that really ask, Lord, keep me walking in your commandments. There, there's no time to, to choose my own path or fool around in secret sin or, or even open sin. It's time to really say, Lord, it's not what I think about a situation, it's about what you think. And that's the direction I need to walk, that's the way I need to live. As the Lord prepares his bride for his return, we want to yield to that working of the Spirit of God. And I think it's the Lord that we're in the, the area, the, the text of Scripture that talks about the giving and the working of the Holy Spirit. And, and where we're at here, abiding in Christ and bringing forth the fruit that is needed, especially in the days we're living in. So as we look through this passage, we're going to begin in verse 1 of John 15. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Now many times in Scripture, God would reveal to Israel that he was, their, he was his vineyard. And he would groom and take care of his vineyard. But after a season, even after all he had done, they would reject him. We see that, and, and we're going to turn to a few scriptures. You can turn with us, or you can hang where we're at, and John will be back. And, uh, and just listen and take notes, whatever you want to do. But we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 5. We're going to look at a few verses there. In Isaiah chapter 5. Look what it says beginning in verse 1. It says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved... A song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. 
and he fenced it, and he gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. We're going to find out that the choicest vine is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. In fact, in the first verse of chapter 15, verse 1 that we read in John, he said he is the true vine, the genuine vine. That he himself is that vine. His people were the vineyard. But he says that he'll plant it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could I have done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes, grapes that were unedible, that he said, I did everything that was necessary for it to produce, and it did not. The, the problem is not on his end for the vineyard not producing grapes. He said, I've done it all. Judge, see. And then he goes on, and he says, and now go to I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. He says, I will lay it waste, and it shall be pruned, nor dug, or it shall not be pruned, I'm sorry, nor digged. But there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant, and looked for judgment, but behold, oppressors for the righteous, but behold, a cry. He's saying that Israel, everything was done for her. And now there is a, an application here as they talk about Israel and Judah. And for, for David's sake, he would preserve Judah and the taken away by the Assyrian Empire. And we talked a lot about that when we were in Isaiah. But I want to take it from there and, and bring us into that understanding of he being the choice vine or he being the genuine or the true vine and what he is telling us that he has done everything for his people to abide in him, but they chose not to. In fact, as a whole, the nation of Israel rejected their Messiah. They turned away from him. In fact, there's a parable that Jesus talks about in Matthew. If you turn to Matthew 21, Matthew chapter 21, Beginning in verse 33. It says here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it about, round about, and digged a wine press in it and built a tower, just like it was stating in Isaiah. And the people of the day knew what Jesus was talking about. And the religious leaders had the reference in their own hearts about Isaiah chapter 5. And it says, Then built a tower and led it out to a husbandman, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husband took his servants and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another as the Lord would send his prophets to Israel, teaching and instructing them on the way of Messiah and their own sinful deeds, and they rejected them. And again, he sent another servant, more than the first, and they did unto him likewise. 
But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. In this parable, the husbandmen, or it's actually translated, the ones left in charge as caretakers, not in a reference to the father, but to the religious leaders. In fact, you'll read if you, I'm going to finish a, another verse here, but if you read through, you'll see that as he gave a couple parables, the religious leaders knew he was speaking about, about them. But let's continue. It says, And when the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? or the caretakers, the religious leaders. And they say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men, and he will let out his vineyard unto another caretaker or husbandman, which shall render him the fruits in their season. He's saying what will happen is they, God will then lend out that vineyard to another. Speaking of the Gentiles, speaking of basically, I will put it this way, all those that put their trust in Jesus the Messiah. All those that put their trust. And Jesus said unto them, Did you ever never read in the scripture the stone which the builder reject, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus is the head of the corner, the cornerstone. Jesus is the true vine, the genuine vine. Jesus is the one that we abide in and trust. He's the one that we look to. He's the one that we surrender to and yield to. And Jesus is calling out in the, in the, in the text in John 15 and encouraging those now, his disciples, to abide in this vine, to stay close. Let, let them abide in, the, in him and he in them. In fact, turn back to John 15. In verse 2, Jesus says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. As we look at that, we will get into the understanding of the branches that don't bear fruit in a few verses down. But those that are bearing fruit, he says that he will step in and he will prune them, purge them. He will, he will do what is necessary to allow them to become more fruitful. In fact, Jesus, the creator of all things, he is the one that is calling us to, to adhere, to abide, to stay in this vine, that, that we would bring forth this kind of fruit, that the fruit would, would blossom forth out of our life. And those that are truly in Christ that have accepted him as their Lord and Savior, knowing he's the Son of God and he died for your sins and rose on the third day. As you are in the vine, there is fruit that comes forth. And in order for God to bring forth more fruit in your life, he says, I will prune them. Now, if you ever pruned a tree, I mean, I guess if I was a tree with the feelings I wouldn't like anyone sawing off a few things, you know? You know, Kirk, those fingers never really worked. Come over here. It wouldn't be a pleasant thing, but a necessary thing to bring forth more fruit. And there are certain things that happen in our lives that are not pleasant, yet from God's perspective, they're necessary because they're to bring forth more fruit through your life. And, and if that's my goal, if, if I can wrap my mind around that and say, Lord, I am here for your good pleasure, that, that 
I, I know there's a lot of things that I like to do, and there's a lot of times I seek my own pleasure, but when it, when it comes right down to it, I know I've been bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm here for your good pleasure, Lord. And if need be, then, then these trials or situations that you have designed are that pruning process that I would bear more fruit. And if it brings you more glory and services your kingdom and accomplishes your will, this is where it's hard, but we must say, then so be it, Lord. Or as Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. That's difficult. I mean, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that my will is the better of the things. I, I just think that, you know. It's just, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm just a guy, and I think, well, of course I, my will's better. And then God's like, oh, a lot of pruning in that bush. And then he begins the pruning process, and I'm like, you know, Lord, my will isn't so good. You, you know what he does? You know how he prunes me sometimes? He lets me have my will. Anyone know what I mean by that? He... He lets me have my will. And then I realized I don't like that at all. Lord, why'd you let me go down that path? <laughs> you know, I'm still blaming God for my choice. And he lets me have my will. And it's the, one of the better pruning tools because then I realize, man, that is not the path to travel. And I'm more apt to turn and let him have his way instead of my own. And so he will prune those that are already bringing forth fruit. Now, now the other we'll talk about, I mean, those are dead branches. They get taken out and thrown into the fire. But the pruning process happens to the believers that are producing a fruit that, that, that demonstrates the salvation of the Lord. But, but there's still a lot of dead stuff hanging on that. There, there's still, on that branch that goes forth from the, the vine, there's still a little bit of extremities there that, that are just not right, and they're sucking up energy and time and distraction, and, and they're hurting the witness, and they're, they're destroying the relationship, and God in his infinite wisdom knows how to come in and take those things off and cut those things out. And, and again, the process isn't always the most pleasant, but I trust him that it's, it's a necessary process. And I bet if we had time, we could give testimony of the times that God had to prune us. And those seasons were hard and hurtful. And, and, and even you felt attacked, but they were necessary to transform us into his likeness and, and to move us into desiring his will, not my way. So he will prune those, he says, that actually are already producing fruit. He says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You, you are clean, you've been cleansed from your sin. You, you have been made alive. You, you basically have been born again or begotten by the Lord to become his son or his daughter. We, we see that even with the word of God itself and the gospel of our salvation, how God sends it forth in order to bring new life. It's an amazing thing when, when you understand or hear or someone shares the gospel or you get the privilege of sharing it with someone else and the gospel by the Spirit of God, their eyes are open and they get it and they understand and they ask Jesus to be their Savior and they come alive, they're born again. And Jesus said, you have been cleansed, you are clean by the word that I have spoken. So he's saying, I've made you alive in me. In fact, a couple scriptures to turn to that I was reflecting on is one in 1 Corinthians. If you turn to 1 Corinthians, 
Or you can, like I said, hang out where you are and listen, whatever you want. Chapter 4. I'll just, I'll, well, I'll read the whole verse, but the main thing is at the end of the verse. Chapter 4, verse 15. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. He is cleansed you. He has made you alive through the understanding of the gospel by, by presenting it, by saving you, by sealing you, by bringing you into that uh, understanding that he's the Messiah, the Son of God, and he died for your sins. Look what it says in 1 Peter. Turn more toward the end of your Bible, 1 Peter. Just for time's sake, you can, if you're a note taker, you can make reference to Ephesians chapter 1, like verses 9 through 14. Good passage of scripture to go to. Look what it says in verse 23 of 1 Peter 1. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by what? By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. You have been quickened and made alive. You've been cleansed of your sin. There's, there's this cleansing process that takes place. You can turn back to John. And if you tie this with that understanding that we have in John, as we uh, previously had read, when remember when Jesus had come to the disciples to wash their feet? And as he laid down his robe and took up a towel and a basin of water and he started washing the disciples' feet, he came to Peter. And Peter said, uh-uh, no way are you washing my feet. I should wash yours. You're not going to do it. And he goes, well, if I don't, you have no part with me. And he's like, man, then give me a bath. And he, what did he say to him? You, you remember. He said, you, those that have already been cleansed don't need a new cleaning, except they need their feet washed. You, you, you don't need to get born again, again and again. But what you need is you need some pruning. You need some cleansing away of the filth that you picked up in this world. You're going to need a little pruning. You don't need a full bath again. And so he's telling those that are producing fruit, those that are truly saved, he's saying, I'm going to need to prune you. I'm going to need to do circumstances in your life that are going to take away some of the self-centered, self-ambitious, fleshly desires and attitudes. I, I, I'm going to step in and do that for you. And again, the process that he uses for each one of us could be different and not always pleasant, but I think that there's a process upon the world that is corporate, and we may be in those very days of that pruning that are going on why the Lord allows his church to become more fruitful and prepared for his return. And so there's a, a process that's taken place. And so back in, in John 15, he tells us what to do. He says, abide in me and I in you. There's this relationship that's established. And, and it goes both ways. You see, I know when I accepted Christ according to Ephesians chapter 1 that he sealed me with the Holy Spirit of promise. I know which we'll touch later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It talks about that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. But there's a two-way street in this abiding process. He abides in us, and we need to abide in him. There's a relationship that needs to be established. The word abide means 
being completely settled in Jesus. Basically, it means that my life does not exist outside of him. That my life needs to be incorporated and understood through Christ, in Christ, and all about Christ. It needs to be all about Jesus, that we're in him, we're living for him. He has my life, he is my life. There's, there's a settled feeling where this is sufficient for me. That, that I have all that I could ever want in Jesus Christ. And that's a place that we need to get to. It's a hard place because there's so much in the world that tells me I need what it has. There's, there's advertisement everywhere. There's pleasure all around me. There's people that are speaking of pleasure. I look around, I think, why are they all happy? And I'm miserable. Why can't I go on that vacation? And the Lord's like, I am your sufficiency. I know, Lord, but... But how about if you and I get a boat, Lord? I mean, a fast one. That would be fun. And, and I'm looking outside the relationship for contentment, to be settled. Godliness with contentment is great gain, the scripture says. But, but I'm looking outside that. And a lot of times we know when we're not settled in the relationship with Christ because we start looking outside of it. And we're thinking, boy, if I could only have that. How many times have I thought in my head, you know, all I need is one more. That's all I need and I'll be happy. That's it. And, and then I get the one more and it gets old pretty fast and then there's a new one. Bigger. Faster. And I think, now that would make me happy. I'm not settled in Christ. I need, and I, and I go through this a lot, I need to put restrictions on myself and say, all right, this is it, that's it, and I need to stop here. It's funny how that line moves. I'm just being honest with you. It's hard to, to, to put that to rest and realize that I have everything in Christ. Everything. In fact, I have more in Christ than they have outside of him. I have a lot more. So he says, abide, to, to be settled in Jesus. My life exists in Christ, not outside of him. And, and knowing this is important because the scripture will teach me as we read through that without him I can do nothing, that, that there's really nothing, there's no strength outside of that relationship. That relationship is everything. And isn't it something on how a pruning, whatever that is, whether it's financial, health, whatever the situation, relationship, it can, it can cause there to be a deeper understanding of the value that you have in the relationship with Jesus Christ. That, that he becomes more important as other things fade away, as things around you diminish the value placed on him can rise and increase. And I don't want to wait till things start falling down around me. I want to start abiding and realizing I am rich already in Christ. There's so much I have in him. And there's so much that's there in the relationship with him. That in that place of godliness and in his will and that relationship, I'm going to be at peace. I'm content because that which brings stability to my life doesn't come from outside or through the world. It comes from in here and through the relationship that, that he has with us. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit, of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. 
That's where life is. That's where fruit is, is in Christ. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That abiding presence of God, as I was researching that, this abiding presence, this understanding that without him, I can do nothing, that, that everything I do is based on this relationship with him, of his very presence in my life. And as I was digging that out, a good understanding of the abiding presence of the Lord is this. The one who has established himself permanently within my soul and always exerts or to put to use his power in me. He, he's, he's the one that has established himself permanently within my soul and always exerts his power, puts to use his power in me. And the problem happens when I don't allow that to take place. I quench it by doing my own work. I grieve it by getting myself involved in the world or the sin around me. But when I surrender to it and it operates, there is a fullness there, a, a, a powerful witness and an evidence of Christ and a working for his kingdom. And as we will see toward the end of the study, there is a joy that is unspeakable, a real joy that comes in in that. Verse 6. It says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth, cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If that subtleness that relationship isn't there it says then that branch is cast forth it is withered men gather it and it burns it, it it has no connection to the vine it's basically this jesus is the giver of life we know that that he is the one that has created all things by him all things are created he is the giver of life. Now, as he is the giver of life, there, there comes a time in this, some point, where he moves on your understanding, and again, whether through its election or free will, he moves and you accept him as Lord and Savior. There, that he's the giver of all life, but there's that place in time where you accept him as Lord and Savior. And in that, you make a choice, or the choice is made within your heart, that you, you, you're going to receive from that vine. You, you want to. That's your sustenance. That's your, the direction of life. That's what you want. But there are those that do not accept the Lord. There are those that do not connect into the vine. Though he's the giver of life, though he brought them into existence, they do not tap into the vine. They do not accept him, walk with him, surrender to him. There, there is no life in that branch that comes from the vine. They, they, they refuse it in whatever way that is. And they wither and they die and they're cast forth. They, they, there is no fruit in that. And it brings forth death, eternal death to them. In simplicity, the only life that there is is in Christ. That's where it's at. There's no eternal life outside of Christ in heaven. There's eternal death, but there's no eternal life. It, 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 he, he's the creator of life, and then he's the redeemer of life. And so those branches that wither, they're not connected into the vine. 
They're not drawing from the life. And it's amazing that, that there's opportunities, at least from my perspective, I see as you share the gospel and people are steadfast and they refuse it. They reject it. They, they don't want it. And, and the choice is made where they no longer or doesn't, do not want to, to abide in this vine. They don't want to accept them as their savior. And they're without an excuse. I mean, it's much like in Romans 1, where it talks about creation itself declares the knowledge of God. And yet there are those that will reject it because they love the creation more than the creator. You can read Romans 1. But they are cast forth and burned, those that are not drawing their life from the true vine. And if you abide in me, it says, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. If, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, I, I love that understanding. I need to be settled in Christ, I need to realize my life comes from Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus Christ. I, I need to understand that in that, I need, to, I need to allow his life to live through me. I need to stay in that fellowship with Christ. And that the relationship has to be one that... that that is there to keep me with him. Let me, let me give you this understanding. In fact, turn to, um, turn to 1 John. 1 John 3. This relationship is so important to know for sure that you're abiding in Christ. It's very important. There are those that deceive themselves and that they say they believe in God, they're, they're, they belong to a certain denomination, but there is absolutely no fruit in their life. I, I've heard over this past election time and past year or so, I've heard many propose that they are in good standings with their religious organization, their so-called faith, and yet the choices and the decisions that they make are so against God's word that, that it befuddles me. How can you say you're a Christian when you're for all these other things? It makes no sense it's because they're not abiding in the vine. There is no genuine exchange between Jesus Christ and themselves. There's no connection there. People do not be deceived. The evidence of my abiding is displayed by the fruit. Is there fruit? I'm not saying perfect. I mean, you pick from my tree, you're gonna get a bad apple once in a while. I mean, I didn't put it there, but it's there. You're, you're going to get you're going to get a bad apple. But the thing is, is is my choice in life to produce bad apples? No, man, I mess up like anyone else, but I don't want to stay in that state. I I truly, in my heart, don't want to practice sin. Oh, there might be occasions I get upset at that driver in that red Toyota that cut me off on 390 yesterday at 2.36 p.m. But other than that, I don't want to stay in sin. But let me tell you something. There'll be people that say they're branches and yet they're all about their own will and will continue in sin and the Lord says they're deceived. And I don't want anyone here to be in that state. In fact, look at this verse in chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Doesn't mean you stumble over sin. It, it, you know, it means that you're, you're consciously willing to continue in your sin. I, it, it's amazing. I've talked to people over the years in counseling and I've shared these things with you before. 
And I told them, you're, 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 what you're doing is sin. It's wrong. I don't care. And then they say something like this, I believe God wants me to be happy. And I'm like, he wants you to be obedient. He, 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 forget the happiness part. If you really surrender to him, there's going to be an internal joy like never before that you're going to experience that's going to fill you greater than anything that the so-called world calls happy. You're going to find it in your relationship with Christ. Don't walk contrary, purposely walk contrary to the word of God. There's, that's, that's a cloud of deception where, where I don't know what to tell you about where you're at with Christ. It says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, and whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. If you make a conscious choice, I'm going to continue to practice in sin, I can't guarantee anything about where you're really at. That's why I'm one that would say, man, just walk away from that. Let it go. Stop hanging on to that. Ask God to forgive you. Turn from it. I'm not talking about stumbling. I'm talking about willful direction of sin. Look at what it says in another verse in um, James. James chapter 4, verse 3. James 4, 3. Now in this, I want to tie it to the scripture where it says that you abide in me, you will ask anything or what you will and it shall be done unto you. Verse 7 of John 15. Well, look what it says here in verse 3 of James 4. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. That, that when he said you can ask what you will and it will be done, it's not using the name of Jesus on the end of a prayer to get what you want. I mean, come on, I, I, years ago, I think I tried that. Lord, I really would like this vehicle. And I know it's mine because I just said in Jesus' name. And it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. He said, you ask because you ask amiss to consume on your own desire. It's not in line with the will of God. It's not in line with the purpose of Christ. It's aligned with your own will and your own purposes. And then again, there goes the, the thing where God sometimes says, okay, you can have that vehicle. And maybe that's happened to you, and after a little while, you're like, why did I ever buy that vehicle? It breaks down constantly. It's the biggest nightmare ever. I had to have that tractor, that vehicle, that equipment, and it's been a nightmare ever since. And he says, pruning you. I'm pruning you. Lord, stop giving me what I want, no matter how much I beg, <laughs> you know. Yeah, in Jesus' name. We, we, he, it, he's telling us that I do want to give you these things, but it comes, it's birthed out of a relationship where all of a sudden you're settled in Christ, your desire is his, you're allowing him to live through you, so it's his will and his work that's coming out, and you're along for the ride, and you're praying, Lord, help me to talk to that person that they may be saved, and he goes, done. Or it may be something. Lord, help us to, to, to be able to get a new, beef, a new building so people can come in and hear the gospel. Done. But it's according to his will because it's based on the relationship with him. It's basically him living his life through you. And then the prayers are aligned with that and they're answered. It's not a magic formula to get what you want. He says, 
You're not going to get it. You're, you're consuming it on your own desire. Do you think the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in you lusteth to envy? The Lord wants you. He desires you. He doesn't want to share you with the world around. I mean, you know, anyone in a marriage knows that. That, that I'm not sharing my wife with anyone. I'm not sharing, you know, something of that nature. There's a relationship, and he, and he, and he treasures it. And it should be treasured by you and by me. But it goes on, and it says, But he giveth more grace, where he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. There's this connection, this relationship. Now watch this. Cleanse your hands, your sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lord, if I'm going astray in my own secret sin or desire, or I've determined in my heart that I'm going to do this anyway, forgive me and turn me from it. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to uh, mourning and your joy into heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Let, let's turn back. I want, I want to tie in a couple more things and then we'll close and move into communion. In uh, John 15, you see, if I am truly abiding and, and settled in Christ, then I can be content with him. I can be content in the relationship with him. And the more that I'm content in the relationship, the less unsettled in life I am, always looking to run and do and buy and have and want, because I pretty much have everything. I do have everything of any real value. Look at the next verse in John 15, verse 8. It says, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. The things that the Lord is doing in your life personally, and I believe in America today, is to prune the church and bring forth much fruit. And if it's the hand of God, believe me, I pray for change. I pray for mercy. I pray for, for continuance in, in, in the times that I remember that I thought were godly and good. I mean, I, I, but, but the bottom line of it all is that God is refining his church to produce more fruit. And I need to be one that says, so be it. Lord, so be it. I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not talking about anything even close to the election and surrendering and, and the improprieties that have been going on or fighting against. I'm not, I'm not moving there in that area. I'm talking personally right now is that, Lord, what you need to do in here, I say so be it so that I bear much fruit for your kingdom and your glory. For your kingdom. We'll get into all the political stuff later, don't worry. But, but I'm talking this. This is important, what's going on here in your walk and my walk with Christ. So it goes on and it says, again, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. That's the place, continuing in that love relationship with Jesus Christ. If you keep my commands, you shall abide in my love, even as I kept my Father's command and abide in his love. Think about this. As Jesus abided in the Father's love, wanted to do everything that the Father told him, wanted to surrender to the Father's will, again said, not my will but thine be done, it brought Jesus to the fulfillment of, of all that he was asked to do to the place where he died on the cross for our sins and positioned in glory for all eternity. Now what Jesus is saying is, well, I love you as the Father loved me, and that love is a sustaining love to move you through all the hard times, to surrender to his will and say, not mine, but yours be done, to bring you into position of glory at the right hand of the Father with the Lord, or at, the, at Jesus, in Jesus with the Lord. 
that, that, that relationship with Christ has to be developed, to, to be lived out, to be, to be the excitement of your life is, is the depth that he wants to take you. And I can tell you this, and I'll tell you, as a, as a man who's been, been married a, a while now, a, a good long while, all right? Very, very good time. Stop, Kirk, okay. Almost, 17, or almost 37 years of marriage is that when you go deeper, it gets better. If you go deeper, it gets better. If it's on the surface, then you're in trouble when the kids move out because your relationship is built on something other than the relationship. It's, it's, it's tied into the external. Now, ours obviously is with the kids and grandkids, but it had to go deeper. And so with your relationship with Jesus Christ, it must go deeper. And it's sustaining and it's keeping and it's... And then it goes on and it says it's joyful. Look what it says. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. The Lord's joy inside us, remaining, staying, living, breathing. One of the things that I want to let you know in... Um, this is for your reference. I, I can't turn. We, we need to go to communion, but I want you to write this down. Numbers, chapter 18, verse 20. And in you, you reading these scriptures, remember, we're called a royal priesthood. And it's going to talk about the, the Levitical priesthood. And it's going to tell them that their inheritance is not in the land, but it's in the Lord. And that's the way it is for us. My, my inheritance isn't in the land of the earth, but it's in the Lord. And then you read in um, Joshua chapter 13, verse 33, and Joshua chapter 18, verse 7, and you realize that the Lord himself was their inheritance, and the service to the Lord was their inheritance. That the, 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 the gifting and the blessing comes from the Lord himself knowing him and serving him. And you might ask, okay, how are we going to do this? How can we truly live for the Lord? Galatians 2 verse 20 says, To reckon yourself crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but not I, it's Christ liveth in me. Allowing Jesus' life to live out in you and through you. Not my will, but his be done. Lord, what do you want to do today? How do you want to live? How do you want to speak to someone? What do you want to tell them? How do you want to respond? I want your life to live through me. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, why don't we turn there and close with that? We'll, we'll turn with that one. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 14 says, Be not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Baal? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel or unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, and now watch this, and walk in them. You see, Jesus wants to live his life through you and in you. And, and the abundance of joyful life is letting them do that. All right, Lord. What's the game plan? What are you going to do today? And he's like, Kirk, I'm going to blow your mind. Are you willing? I'm, I'm strapped in, Lord. Let's do it. I don't want to just grab Jesus and tag him along for my ride. I want him to live. And in that, he says, my joy is fulfilled, and, or my joy is full, and your joy will be fulfilled. As if you let him have his way. I will live in them, abide with them, dwell with them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So come out. 
from among them. Be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let us be serious and say, Lord, here I am. I just want your life to be lived through me. May not go the direction I want it to go, but it's going to go your direction. And in that, there's joy. In that, there's fruit. In that, there's peace. I truly have the best inheritance ever in Jesus. I mean, I see what the world has, but I got to tell you, I have something far greater. It's like, it's like going to, uh, to the reading of a will. And it's at the death of Jesus. And the lawyer gets up and says, well, to you, you are le left worldly prosperity and material goods. And they're like, yeah, oh, wow. And to you, you are left health and wealth and, and all the things that you could ever want. Right on. And to you, Kirk, you're left my son Jesus and eternal life. I got the better deal. So did you. You got the better deal. Father, may we abide in you. May we allow your will and your life to be lived through us. Because I know in that there is such joy and such peace. And the abundance of fruit for your kingdom and glory is and will be amazing to see. And so, Lord, keep us. Let our eyes be fixed on you and let the relationship with you deepen. Teach us how to do that privately, individually, and corporately as we continue this chapter together. We thank you. We praise you. And here we come to remember what you have done to secure that relationship by coming by living, by dying in our place, and being raised from the dead. So prepare our hearts as we partake in communion and remember these things. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would take your communion cup, and there is a thin mylar layer on top, not the foil. If you pull that first layer off, you'll get the wafer. Pull the foil off, you'll get the juice. Jesus Christ gathered his disciples and he said, this is my body which is given to you. Jesus paid the full price and he died in our place. And the stripes and beatings that were laid upon him brings a healing and an everlasting life. Let us remember what he's done for us and partake together. Thank you, Lord, for your death and resurrection. Thank you for taking our sin upon yourself and paying the price in full at the cross. We thank you in Jesus' name. At supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the New Testament in Christ. This is his blood that was shed for us as we understand that he died in our place. He shed his blood. And as we look upon it and we understand as we remember by taking this juice, we reminded that as he shed his blood, it was sufficient to wash away all our sin. He paid the full price. He established a blood covenant with you and I. Let us thank him and partake together. Lord, thank you that you have cleansed us, that you've washed us, that you renewed our 